Thank you, um, Dr. Kelly. Um, it's just a pleasure to be here with you this morning. And thank you for inviting me. I'm just so excited to be part of your organization um, in working with you going forward. So yes, I'm really, really delighted to, to be here. So I'm just gonna give a bit about um, myself, you know, background about myself and my area of work. So I've been a nurse practitioner for over 38 years now. And I've obviously worked in various sectors of the NHS and also I'm a Queen's nurse, which was a title that was given to me in 2012 um, for my leadership and um, quality of uh, patient care. And I've lived to that, um, as you will see from what I've been doing. I also have background in district nursing and I've worked in various capacity uh, within the NHS, including board nurse in, on 2CCG. I think I'm probably one of the first um, black nurse to be appointed to 2CCG in London. I have also worked as a director of nursing and operation with um, a social enterprise, GP cooperative, managing six urgent care centers, as well as out of hours and um, the NHS 111. In 2008, I set up a, a consultancy uh, after being made redundant. And so I started consulting um, to the NHS, um, primarily in commissioning. So I was involved in service redesign and um, looking at service transformation. But in 2004, um, I mean, 2014, I stood um, as an elected councillor. So I've been an elected councillor since 2014. And in 2017, I became the, the mayor, elected mayor of the borough. But it was only just for one year. During that time, I decided to use the platform to raise awareness about diabetes only because as a nurse and having experienced um, issues around diabetes, most especially around um, black and ethnic minority um, patients that I have nursed and the complication arising from diabetes, I felt that it was a great opportunity to use that platform to raise awareness and to work with every sector of the community to talk about diabetes. So when I finished as a mayor, I also felt that there's a need for us to look at diversity in diabetes because we, well, I personally realized that um, the black and ethnic minority um, majority of black and ethnic minority are not having access to um, adequate diabetes education and support at the rate of the white population. Secondly, I also realized that the option um, in terms of the treatment are not readily available as well. I'll talk about that in a moment. Also, totally, um, black and native minority are not using the diabetic technology as the same rate with the white population. And as well as the fact that you know, we do not have enough black and any minority healthcare provider as well as the diabetic educator. So for me, it's important that we start talking about diversity in diabetes. And we now know why, as we can see from this current pandemic as well. The COVID-19 itself, I've also shown a light on the racial and ethnic health disparity. I'm not too sure how many of you have actually read the um, public health inquiry into the number of the death rate that we've had or experience within our community, which some of them have resulted um, due to the underlying health conditions such as diabetes. But the fact of the matter is, is that 
do we think you know um, is to just is just due to the underlying health condition, or in fact is due to the years of social economic inequality, which we know is a determinant of health in itself, and other factors such, such as institutional racism. So, as a founder and of course um, someone from healthcare background, I've had firsthand knowledge about the impact of um, health inequality and the outcome. So for me, it's about you know, using this platform to continue to raise awareness of that and to see what can be done to address those inequality. So that was the, one of the reasons, as I mentioned, to set up the um, Diabetic Action CIC. I know that we have bigger organization um, that have been working um, in the sector, but for me, I have not seen much evidence about how they're reaching out to the black and ethnic minority. So if I just go into the statistics itself. So the statistics um, evidence that diabetes is one of the most pressing health and social care challenging that we face today. It is estimated that about 4 million people are affected by diabetes in the UK and it's the leading cause of death and accounts for significant financial costs of the NHS um, budget. Apart from the um, growing aging population, which means that the number of people with diabetes um, is actually increasing, we also know that um, by the 20. 35, um, the population of people with diabetes is likely to rise to up to 6.2 million. And within that, um, black and any minority are six times more likely, especially within the South, South, I mean, South Asian um, group, and three times more likely from the African and Afro-Caribbean people. We also know that um, the lifestyle intervention um, is not um, taken up by the black and ethnic minority group as well. So we have a lot of issues on our hand. So if we look at the current landscape of the pandemic itself, and as I said, we have seen that um, people with diabetes have sadly died as a result of um, contracting the, um, the virus. So which goes to show to us that we actually need to do a lot of more work within our own community itself. Since um, the pandemic, uh, my organization have been working locally to support people who are being affected by, the, um, by COVID. Some of whom are either required to social, um, I mean, to isolate um, at home. We also know that you know, people have lost their job. So they're gonna have additional um, burden of having to be able to um, eat healthy. So the charity itself have been able to support people at home with food parcels and I can tell you now, we've um, actually given out over 3,000 food parcels, as well as over 3,000 hot meal since the pandemic, and it's continued to grow. So it's a double uh, whammy jeopardy for our community. And I, as I said, I'm delighted that, you know, uh, I'm now on your platform or connecting with you and with your own um, network, perhaps it's something that you know, we need to think about how we're going to reach out and to support um, one another and uh, our community with that. So I just want to, this point, talk about what it's diabetes in itself. Maybe I'm teaching people that already know about diabetes, but maybe just to put it in perspective. So we have, um, about may, uh, mainly three types of diabetes. So you have type one, type two, and gestational diabetes. 
those are the three main ones. So though they're now talking about there is a type C, the type, um, type C diabetes. But I'll just talk about those three main ones. So the type one is as a result of autoimmune condition, which means that the body itself for some reason um, have stopped producing insulin. So insulin is an hormone that help us to um, metabolize um, uh, carbohydrates. When we eat carbohydrates, it turns into glucose and the insulin in the body is the key that helps to transport the glucose into all the cells of the body for the cells to function. So when you don't have um, insulin, it means that um, when, when you eat carbohydrates and it turns into glucose, then there is an increase. So there is no optimum balance within the body itself. So that is why with increase in, in the glucose level, it can result to going into the people's eye and um, that is why they have retinopathy or they might have neuropathy. Then you would have condition where you know you they will they would then have to excrete the um, the byproduct of the glucose through their kidneys. That is why, with time, then they will be um, having to go to the toilet frequently. With time, it can lead to kidney failure or ketoacidosis. So those are the etiology briefly um, about type one diabetes. It can also lead to um, all sorts of damages to, to the cells. In fact, diabetes is one of the main conditions that actually affect every part of our body, more than even the cancer. Cancer usually affects maybe one area of your body and then metastasize to other parts, but diabetes actually affects every organs of the body. When you have, when you develop that, usually diabetes. I mean, type one is developed before the age of forty. But we are seeing that more and more now that um, as young as um, fourteen years old are actually developing diabetes because of obesity. So again, that's another issue. With type two diabetes, of course, um, is because either. Um, the, there is a resistance to the um, uh, glucose in the body or reduction in the production of the um, insulin in the pancreas. So the way the metabolism works is that you eat, it goes into your stomach to, to, you know, to digest and the enzymes you know, will um, turn your carbohydrates into glucose. And then once you have the glucose, uh, once you have um, increased glucose in the body, the pancreas um, will get into action to produce insulin so that you know you can um, you can allow the, the glucose to go into the cell. So the insulin is the key, is we call it is the key that unlock for the cells to obtain your glucose, then for you to make energy. So when that lock is turned off or there is not enough of it, then you have excess glucose in the body. So it's then become the same mechanism with someone who have type one diabetes. So that means there is excess glucose floating in the body. And after some time, you will have excessive tests. You will be going to the toilets even more. Some people will develop infection. If they have um, developed, um, if you happen to have an injury, um, it can lead to the, you know, the infection not getting better, or they may have neuropathy. So it's the same process. So what then happens is that how do we address the, um, the condition? For type 1 diabetes, they have to result in having to use injection, which is insulin. But with the um, type 2, initially it would be medication. But we also know that after some time, um, when people don't have adequate control, the type two diabetes might result in also um, taking insulin or using insulin. With gestational diabetes, it's a condition that happens in pregnancy. 
And again, we still don't know the etiology of that, but it tends to be people who are either hereditarily inclined to develop diabetes in the first place, so they would develop that, or it could be increased in demand because of the, um, of the pregnancy. So the gestational diabetes itself um, can result into a lot of complications like premature birth or, or defects in that. So that is also important. And that is why it's important that we also um, campaign about diabetes in schools so that our young people understand about diabetes itself because you know teenage pregnancy and all of that issues. So that is quite important um, as well. So in terms of um, the organization, as I mentioned, is, is a platform in which um, I set up for us to work locally to raise awareness about diabetes, because we know that 90% of um, diabetes or people with diabetes are type two and it's preventable. So if it's a preventable condition, why then do we, um, or why there's no wider campaign about how to, uh, to prevent it? Because it's preventable, because we know it's related to metabolism and is related to our diet, physical activities. And it doesn't cost as much in terms of prevention. So if we can do something about it, then at least we can help those group of people um, from developing type two diabetes. And that is the mission that I'm on, that everywhere I go, I want to raise the awareness of it to ensure that we can at least support people from developing it in the first place. But even if they develop the type two, they can still reverse it. They can reverse it with lifestyle modification. So that comes to the point that recently in summer, I've, um, I've actually had opportunity to develop an app for the diabetes action. It's in a beta form at the moment, it's still in developing stage, but I'm quite excited that opportunity that brings in the sense that we've been able to use it to disseminate information you know, quite easily. And I think this is something that I would like to work with the Institute of well, uh, Wellbeing in reaching out to your network for them to be able to use the, the app. And also the current pandemic has given us another platform, which is now what we're using now. So in summer, I've been working with um, the local um, residents um, or people that are part of the um, diabetic action. We use it to um, create a, a platform for fitness activity. So we're using Zoom to actually um, reach out to people in their own home, in the comfort of their own home, to take up um, physical activity. So there is a great opportunity for us now in terms of the tools that we have. Yes, some people might not have um, access to technology, but I'm sure everyone has a phone now, even if they don't have the ones that can work with that, they can connect with audio. Or my mission would be if we can even get a lot of people with their own tablets, then they will be able to have access to that technology. So in the new year, I'm actually going to be working with the Institute of um, Queen's Nurse and um, Bodet to um, do a research. Uh, to explore the impact of using digital technology um, for the uptake of diabetic prevention amongst black and ethnic minorities. So I'm so excited about that. So I'll be working with the GP locally to recruit um, participants and we're going to use that opportunity for lifestyle modification. So they're going to have 12 months access to um, peer support as well as mindfulness coaching, uh, physical activity, um, you know, cookery classes. So yes, I'm really, really excited about um, that project um, in the new year. So I'm just going to um, round up um, for now um, so I can take 
questions from yourself, but we have a lot of tax on our hands. And if nothing have really um, gets us to think about our community, I think the moment is now. We've heard about Black Lives Matters. Now we need to know about diversity matters in diabetes and is in our hands to do something about it. So we can begin to improve outcome for a lot of our um, community so that they don't end up with um, heart failure, kidney failure, when we know that the cost of um, dialysis itself, kidney dialysis is about 30,000 pounds a year. And it's something that could be avoided. So what I'm saying here is that we could do something about it. So let's, let's make it happen. So, right, so I talk about diet. Um, okay, again, I'll just talk past from my personal experience. My maternal generation um, had, they all had diabetes. So you know, my grandparents from my maternal side, they all had diabetes, including my mom. My mom lived to 80. Even though she developed that type two diabetes, um, I think around in her fifties, she never had complications from it because I was beside her in terms of the diet. So she was able to manage her diabetes with diet. And I'm 56 now. <clears throat> Statistically, I should develop diabetes. I have the tendency to develop diabetes um, type two diabetes myself. In fact, I think at some stage, my blood glucose was in a quite high into um, pre-diabetes stage. But, and then I said, no, I'm not going to have uh, medication. So I started um, uh, using um, diets, um, healthy diets as well as exercise and I've reversed it. So I'm not in, I've not got diabetes and I'm not taking medication for diabetes. So in terms of prevention, it is possible. Yet our diet, a lot of our diet is actually cap. So we just need to modify the amount and increase other, you know, like vegetables. There is also the notion that people eat fruits. There are certain fruits actually that are actually high, high content glucose. So people don't understand that as well. For example, you will have patients eating grapes. They think they're eating fruit, but inadvertently, uh, one piece of, um, of grape is to me is the equivalent of a cube of sugar. So it's not that you cannot eat certain fruit, but you just need to be able to understand the type of fruit and the quantity to eat. The issues about um, the, um, also the, your fat content as well, you need to modify that because again, that can, um, when you have fats around your liver or, or your pancreas, it means that you know, the insulin production is not up to the optimum as well. So you need to manage and balance all your diets. So it's about that as well as physical activity. If you are a sedentary person, not really uh, physically active, that in itself will make you to put on weight. When you put on weight, there is more fat around your liver and, and your system. So that again, stop you from utilizing the um, insulin in your body. And it can lead to insulin resistance as well. So it's not just the key locking, but also you can also have insulin resistance when it's not actually functioning. So those are the critical things to think about. And of course, we know with our children as well, not developing obesity because there's a easy access to fast food. So a lot of people, you know, in the younger age now, they're eating because it's convenient. But by the time they realize it's in their forties, the damage is actually done. I mean, a lot of people with diabetes do not actually realize that they are already developing the condition. It takes about five to 10 years 
that they've already started to develop the condition before they even know. So it's a quite a silent um, killer condition, which doesn't really show, um, you know, physically. So how do we address that? You asked about reversing the, um, the condition. Again, people that have already been on medication, if we catch them early enough and we work with them in terms of their lifestyle modification, again, looking at you know, diet, physical exercise, other, other um, um, you know, checking their eyesight or, you know, there are things that we can do to reverse that. And also now they, there's been a research done about the calorie intake of their food. So we know with um, 800 um, calorie a day, you can actually reverse um, the condition, but obviously it has to be under control and monitoring as well. So yeah. it's doable because um, I monitor what I eat, even though I'm not actually using um, you know, liquid diets, like some people will go on, on their weight management and they're given this liquid uh, diet and they expect you to live on that. That is not sustainable for me. That is not what I'm talking about. And that's why I want it to be culturally and sensitively led diabetic prevention because you can't just transport uh, what sort of research that has been done on maybe a different cohort of uh, people and transfer it to the black and ethnic minority. And that is why there's been a failure in compliance. And that is always you know, the reason why a lot of black and ethnic minority have not been able to take that up, the mm -hmm. diabetic prevention, because you can't just live on liquid diet. That, that is unrealistic. Mm -hmm. But I know it works with our own food, where you modify what you eat in terms of the calorie you just eat a lot of more uh, veg will cater for your loss of the um, small carbohydrates in your diet. And that is the way to do it. And then exercise. So it's, it's possible. Yeah. The other thing I just want to mention quickly is that the reason why it's possible is that, as I said, the condition tends to happen from the age of 40. So even though when we were younger, we used to have about 1,250 calories a day because of, you know, you're running around, there's a lot of energy activity. But as you're growing older, perhaps you're not doing that much of activity. So you don't really need to have that 1,250 um, calorie a day. So you're more likely, you'll find that actually once you start programming your body to reduce your calorie, the body adjusts to it. Now I realize that perhaps, you know, one or two meal a day and then with fruit is enough. And I have my energy and with exercise and, you know, you get your energy. So, and it's my food, it's the food that I actually want to eat. So I know it's possible. Yeah, so that is why I also want to go and do this research as well to prove actually that actually, yes, it can be done within our own group, yeah. No, that's brilliant. And I think that's, that helps us with the diversity in diabetes piece because we don't want that a diet that doesn't work, that it's not flavoursome, it doesn't yeah. feel cultural and, and so on. So I've got one more technical question for you and I would love everyone else to join in after this. Um, let's assume there is someone who is relatively fit and healthy. They do exercises, they eat well. Um, Yeah, um, as I said earlier on, there's um, hereditary factor uh, with the condition. Um, there's still a lot of research going on around why some people, like I said, they're healthy, but they still end up um, developing diabetes. So that, you know, it's possible. And even type one, as we said, some people do not get diagnosed until in their twenties with type one. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's to do with this insulin autoimmune. It's just like some people would develop lupus, which is autoimmune um, condition. So for some reason, you know, their system just shut down producing insulin. So basically, 
So it's nothing to do with their um, lifestyle, but it's just the, the autoimmune. Um, and that could be as a result of stress as well. When you develop stress, you will release cortisol, which can you know, damage your cells and all of that as well. So yeah, it is possible. at this moment to tell people is about smoothies. Because I was in the same boat. I initially thought I was doing the right thing by having smoothies with fruit and veg, but not knowing that actually I was increasing my blood glucose because what happened was when you blend the fruit and especially if they have high content um, glucose, it goes straight into the bloodstream. So it means that the, your stomach, when you eat, is not being processed as you, you know, like break it down. So you've already done the work of what you, happens in your stomach by the smoothies. So again, there is a misconception about people actually, um, you know, using fruits and veg for smoothies and then thinking they actually drink something healthy but inadvertently, um, that could also cause a problem. So there, we need to have a little more education around that as well. Okay. Thank you. Doctor or the healthcare professional, because yes, you can do the um, point of care tests, which is just simple blood glucose tests um, with a strip, but that does not measure the accurate, um, what, the accuracy of whether you've got diabetes or not, because it depends on what you've just eaten at that moment in time, or yes. But if you, the, the normal uh, measure for diabetes is HbA1c. So that is the blood test that we do, which captures average of your three monthly level of your HB1C, which would then give you the, the value. Yeah, what? For, to determine whether or not you've got diabetes. So it's best to have that blood test. Then no, that will give you, yeah. No, that's... I would say that um, anyone that is over 45, again, the NHS is offering NHS check. So everyone over the age of 45 is at the moment off it anyway, they full health screening. So they should be assessing that. So once they do that, and um, if their HbA1c is normal, then they will not need to be recorded. But if they're going into pre-diabetes, then uh, which is between 41 and uh, 47 minimums of the um, HbA1c one reading, then of course, then they would um, give them um, yearly um, tests. Um, but people with diabetes um, do have to have at least six monthly tests as well, um, just to check the HbA1c is, is under control. So these are the things that they can get from their own GP as well. Right. Or if they have family history of diabetes, then maybe earlier on, it's good for them to have that checked as well. It can be quite confusing um, because as Stella said, likes a cup of tea. Okay, someone may put a spoon or two of sugar in. Then you have cereals. And then you have all these other things with hidden sugars so you've actually started the lay, the day fully loaded um is there something you could suggest i'm not saying you're a nutritionist i'm not saying this is advice that everyone must follow i'm just saying is there an example of a good start a good breakfast that's low in calories low in sugar yeah for me is always my witterbix I love to have Witabix. I can eat as much as of that. So there's no sugar and it's high in fiber. Um, oatmeal, as our, our mom just mentioned, oatmeal is quite good for you. You can put natural honey, a little bit of that if you want to avoid sugar. 
Um, so that is quite good egg. Although you shouldn't eat it too much during the week. You can have boiled egg or poached egg um, for your breakfast. Then maybe your wholemeal bread, proper bread, maybe two slices of that will set you up for the day. I also tend to have natural yogurt with um, some fruit like strawberry, not much of it uh, for my breakfast. Um, yeah, so that is mainly what I eat. I tend to, you know, those conflicts, no go area because it's got sugar, um, hidden sugar, and that would definitely raise your um, glucose level. The other thing that tends to raise our glucose level is also pasta. Um, you know, th th there is, I have this glycemic index as well of certain foods which I can share with people. Um, some of the food that have high um, glycemic index is what you need to avoid. So once you know that, then you can avoid that in your diet and exercise more. Yeah. Fantastic. But it's important that you have your breakfast in the morning as well. Yes, yes. Because if you don't have your breakfast in the morning, it's the best food of the day because then that sets you off. But once you meet your breakfast, it means when you're going to go to have lunch, you would tend to want to eat more. And that is not good. So you need to spread what you eat throughout the day. So it's important to have breakfast. And also because, you know, we've slept overnight for hours. So our, our um, stomach is empty. So it's important that, you know, we have breakfast, even if it's just more meal or uh, food in the morning. Describe that um, to the letter, yeah. but obviously, some of the soft drinks not really good for us um, at, at all. But equally, some of the uh, labeled fruit juice, for example, I also know that a lot of them have <laughs> eating sugar. So, what are people going to eat unless you make your own drink? then it's quite difficult, um, really. But also, um, if we say to people to cut out everything, people still need to want to enjoy. It might be, you know, um, they're attending their friend's party and um, they just want to socialize. So to be prescriptive and say to people, cut this out completely, I think for me, it, it's gonna be difficult. It's just like what we're saying during this COVID. Some of the government instructions, how many people are actually following it? That is just the nature of people. But if people are actually conscious of their own health, then they will know once they have um, informed information and they really want to stick to, you know, to that, because that is their willpower, then they will stick to healthy options. That is the way I believe in it, to operate um, education. So it's not, yes, you'll be prescriptive in terms of telling people what is not beneficial to their body. By the end of the day, it will be down to individuals to take up you know, the health advice. Yeah. So it's kind of quite, um, difficult one, but I'm hoping that when people make a conscious mind that they want to address, um, you know, their elder lifestyle, then they will do so with the information. Um, if I want to be prescriptive, I say, just drink water. You're saying <laughs> just drinking water. And um, it doesn't cost much to have that. But uh, whether that is sustainable is, yeah. So I think it's about balancing that, yeah.